Good afternoon all. I am Tapas, uh, Associate Fellow at the Foundation for Agrarian Studies. On behalf of the Foundation, I welcome you all to the fifth seminar of the FAS Young Scholar Online Seminar Series. As you all aware that this is the platform for young scholar working in the field for, of agrarian studies and on socioeconomic life in rural India to present their work to the larger community, research community working in the similar areas and to explore the, the possibilities for future collaboration. As the coordinator of the seminar series, I thank you all of you for your participation here. I also thank the Roja Alexander Stephen, uh, South Asia for their continuous support in the running this seminar series. As you all know, this seminar series uh, has been covering a range of topics, including the agricultural production, agrarian and labor relation, rural in economy, caste in rural India, the question of women's work in rural India, and the science and technology in agriculture. We are most fortunate that Professor Barbara Harris White, the Emeritus Professor of Development Studies at the University of Oxford, is chairing all these seminar series. Her uh, expertise and insightful comments have been instrumental in enriching the seminar series in many ways. I again thank you, Professor Barbara, for agreeing to chair the seminar. Today is the fifth seminar of the series, and our speaker is Kanti Nanduri. Uh, she is an assistant professor at the Jindal School of Banking and Finance. And I'm happy to inform you that she has successfully defended her PhD thesis yesterday at the Indian Institute of Management, Calcutta. Many congratulations, Kanti. Uh, Today she will be speaking about her research based from its uh, PhD topic, uh, PhD thesis, the uh, pattern of accumulation and differentiation in the uh, non-agrarian informal sector in India. In view of today's topic uh, seminar, I will take this opportunity to let you know that the foundation has been taking efforts to understand the particular relation between the farm and non-farm sector in rural India, particularly in context of employment and incomes. However, our studies have found, we find that the, the, there's a diversification to non-farm sector as a class element. While we see that the landlord and rich capitalist household in rural India has been diversifying for accumulation of surplus. While the, uh, the, small, while the small peasantry and the manual worker household diversify their income sources for survival. In our recent uh, study of aggregate relation in rural community delta, Tamil Nadu, it is based on the two survey of two villages we found that, that urban economy is quite central to the livelihoods of the residents of these two villages. About 40% of the total incomes comes from these urban locations, particularly among uh, wage worker households who are uh, mostly involved, uh, involved with the skilled wage worker. Their earnings comes largely from the urban location. It also reflects that the lack of skilled employment opportunity within the village. This book, edited by Madhura Shaminathan, D. Saurjit, and B. K. Ramachandran, is at final stage of publication. I would invite scholars interested in the rural economy to do have a look at these books on agrarian relations in India, published by the Foundation. Now, uh, today's seminar, uh, Dr. Vimesh Reddy, he is an assistant professor, Department of Economics and Finance, Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Bilani, Hyderabad campus, will act as a discussion. Thank you for agreeing. Now, uh, without taking much time, let me call upon to the today's chair, uh, the chair to initiate and moderate the proceeding. In the interest of time, it is suggested that you in the audience kindly key in your comments and questions in the Zoom Q and box. They will be taken up in the interactive session that will follow the presentation. May I call up Professor Bhattar. Thank you, Tapas, and thank you, Sujan. Um, this is proving to be a very exciting project, and I look forward not only to today, but also to the rest of the year. Many congratulations to our speaker, Kanti Nandri, um, who has just successfully defended um, her thesis. So this will be, in some sense, a second fiver. But you will have a different set of examiners. Um, you will have Dr. Riddhi from Bits Pilani Hyderabad, and you will have me, and you will have a big audience of people whom I hope, um, as Tapan just said, will write their questions into the chat box. The sooner the better, so that we can order them nicely in the discussion afterwards. As the chair, I need to remind everybody <clears throat> of the timing. I'm a terrible timekeeper. Um, the Foundation for Agrarian Studies knows this. 
Um, but Kranti, if you could speak for 25 to 30 minutes, and uh, Bhimashwar, if you could give your discussions comments for between five and 10 minutes, I will add some of my own, and then we will turn to the Q&A generated through the chat box. Now, the session is officially 60 minutes, and if anybody has to leave, they're most welcome to leave after 60 minutes, but we might go on, we always do go on for 10 to 15 more minutes because the discussion has been so generative. Okay, over to you, Kranti, non-agrarian informal sector, accumulation and differentiation. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, the Foundation for Agrarian Studies, Professor Barbara, and everyone for giving me this opportunity. And uh, so I'm just sharing my screen. Um, yeah, I'll try and stick to 30 minutes in my presentation. So today I'm going to talk about patterns of accumulation and differentiation in the non-agrarian informal sector, which is a small part of my uh, PhD thesis titled Informality and Accumulation Processes in India from the Standpoint of Capital. Uh, so in this uh, paper, in this presentation, I'll broadly discuss about the analytical framework that we are using to approach accumulation and differentiation within the non-agrarian informal sector, and we call it standpoint of capital, which I'll discuss later on. And in the first part, I'll try to highlight the relationship between per capita income, agricultural labor productivity at the state level, and try to establish its relevance for the study of accumulation, informal accumulation processes, especially in the Indian context. And then, uh, because we're talking about the accumulation and differentiation pattern, two important indicators are labor productivity and capital intensity levels, about which we will see how uh, it is it stands in India today. And then I'm also exploring in this presentation the tendencies towards differentiation in the informal sector and how it's related to the capital intensity levels. And uh, this paper, is, so in this way, it's basically trying to locate the diverse patterns of accumulation and differentiation in the sector within the broader processes of agrarian accumulation and structural change. And it also briefly uh, in this presentation highlights the role of agrarian crisis in shaping the informal accumulation process. And just to quickly introduce you, when we're talking about an informal economy, there are two dimensions. One is informal employment, which is a job-based concept or definition. And the other is informal sector, which is enterprise-based definition. And in this presentation, and even in my thesis, I focus on this informal sector, which is an enterprise-based definition. And in literature, generally, when we talk about informal sector or even unorganized sector, it refers to the non-agrarian informal enterprises. And uh, so when all the studies that are existing, majority of the studies which are talking about informal enterprises, uh, we argue that they're looking at it from the standpoint of labor. What do I mean by it is that here in this standpoint, informal enterprises are primarily seen as transitional and intermittent sites of surplus labor absorption. And so this means that they're actually looking at uh, the sector as a means to generate incomes and sustain livelihoods for the surplus labor. And the mainstream nar narrative generally characterizes these informal enterprises as an undifferentiated category of low productivity and transition entities which will eventually disappear in the face of competition against the formal sector. And the ILO framework argues that these informality levels, be it in terms of employment or informal sector, uh, they're inversely related to per capita income levels. But uh, the, as we know, Indian experience suggests that informality not only persists, but it is also rising over time, despite the rising levels of per capita income. And just to present a quick overview of the non-agrarian informal sector in this presentation, I'm basically focusing on two rounds of NSSO data, 67th and 73rd round, which is in 2010, 11, and 2015, 16. And when I define an informal enterprise here, I'm taking the NCUS definition uh, for my empirical purpose analysis, which is less than 10 workers, an enterprise that is having less than 10 workers. And as we see between these two points in time, uh, it has the number of informal enterprises and the number of informal workers have actually increased. If you see at a rate of 1.7%, the enterprises and at a rate of 1.3%. And the majority of this increase, we actually notice it in the urban sector, that is urban informal sector, uh, where it is uh, enterprises are growing at a rate of 2.8% CAGR and workers have increased at almost similar 
uh, rate, 2.4 percent. And we also see that the output generated by this sector has also increased between the two points of time. And the output uh, output for worker, which we use GVA per worker as an indicator or the proxy for labor productivity, and fixed assets per worker as a proxy to understand capital intensity, and that also has increased. And which I will discuss much more later about the trends. And so uh, here, whenever we are talking about informality, uh, and if we are only emphasizing on per capita income as a key driver of market growth, it is actually ignoring the role of agricultural labor productivity as one of the key drivers of domestic market growth, and also as a source of or a driver of export market growth through the processes of partial proletarianization and rural non-farm economy growth. So consequently, what happens is that the role of agricultural labor productivity in shaping the potential of accumulation and differentiation in the informal sector, particularly the rural informal sector, is not paid its due attention. And therefore, this paper draws attention to that centrality, that relationship the centrality of the relationship between agricultural labor productivity to the study of accumulation in the non-agrarian sector, which works its way through the dynamics of home market creation. And just to give a little bit idea about this mechanism. So we know that this labor productivity in agriculture is important for continuous transformation uh, process of ec economic growth and structural transformation in two ways. One, like I said, in terms of creating a domestic market, and two, in terms of capital accumulation. And how it happens is that when this productivity rises, there is rising agricultural output and incomes of the population dependent on it, which is also forming a basis for non-agricultural market goods and services. And when that happens, when there is demand for non-agricultural output increasing, uh, they, it can actually in turn generate demand for labor in non-agriculture sector, depending, of course, on the labor intensity of the sector. And so while this is happening on the demand side, on the other hand, uh, labor productivity in agriculture can also increase surplus value generated in the sector, which can increase capital formation under certain conditions. So this kind of, this idea of successful accumulation process can give us two impetus. One is tendencies towards proletarianization of labor, or let's say penetration of wage labor, be it complete part, uh, proletarianization or partial proletarianization, and also towards tendencies of differentiation of petty commodity enterprises. So in this thesis, and also in my paper, what uh, we are approaching the informality from the standpoint of capital. And what I mean by it is that, A, the informal sector can be a potential site of capital accumulation, where the relationship is manifested between capital intensity and labor productivity levels and growth. And two, that there can be tendencies towards differentiation between capital and labor under certain conditions of market growth. And here for the study, we actually look at 21 states uh, and I'm here uh, ranking them in the ascending order of per capita income levels or per capita GSDP levels. And we see a uh, striking uh, stability of this relative, like four states remain poor over these periods of time from let's say 1993, 94 to 2017, 18 and rich states remain rich states. Uh, the only exceptions being let's say Jammu and Kashmir, which we can from richer to poorer state and Andhra Pradesh, which moves from being poor to just about the all India average. And of course, there are variations within this sector. There are movements, but overall, this looks like this uneven development is a structural, probably a structural feature of the Indian economy. And when we look at the rich states and poor states, so when we club and look at the averages just to understand the macro uh, trends, let me just throw a caution here. I know most of you work with related studies of the prime. So it, macro trends might be very uncomfortable. So I'm not saying that this is a generalizable trend which will follow in each and every state within every region, but these are just broad macro trends that we are looking at to understand the relationship. Okay. So then uh, here, so when I'm just taking the ratio of rich states to poor states, uh, if the ratio is greater than one, it means that that value is higher in richer states. So we see that uh, number of enterprises in rural areas uh, are actually higher in poorer states. But uh, in urban areas, it is rich states, which is having higher number of informal enterprises and workers. And likewise, the output generated in these sectors is also higher in the richer states in urban areas. But despite this fact, it is interesting to note that the GDP per worker or the labor productivity and the capital intensity are higher in the richer states, be it rural areas, or urban areas, which is an interesting point. And likewise, uh, just to quickly note the structural two broad trends that we have noticed is that in the urban areas, the increase has been happening in terms of 
uh, informal enterprises in terms of informal uh, workers workers engaged in the informal sector uh, just to remember this is not the entire informal employment these are only workers engaged within the informal sector that i'm talking about right even the output has grown in the urban informal sector especially in poor states and another interesting trend that we note is that in rich states especially in rural areas the informal enterprises and workers have contract right but uh, the other interesting relation we explore in the thesis is that these high per capita income states majority of them are higher agriculture labor productivity states also which is highlighted in green in poor states also we have few of them there are some exceptions like west bengal and rajasthan and when we look at this correlation coefficient between these two indicators it is strikingly higher is positive and strong and it increases from 2004 5 right and why that is happening is probably we are see as per capita income levels begin to rise between these two categories of states at the same time it's agriculture output per worker or the labor productivity rises noticed and even the non agricultural labor productivity is uh, rising so uh and whenever we are talking about agriculture labor productivity or agriculture productivity we also tend to think about land productivity which can be measured through gross value added per hectare levels so what we notice is that actually that is not the driving factor the land productivity is not the driving factor of the difference between these states we see that they are tending to converge and even statistically the difference between is them is not significant across any of the periods but if you look at the agriculture productivity levels it is actually uh, increasing and that is statistically significant from 2004 in these three points of time so and uh, i would not discuss much here about this this is discussed in another chapter particularly but it's important to measure that there is inequality in capital formation between rich and poor states there are no a large scale secondary uh, sources available for this but from whatever literature we could gather information at state level for the capital formation in agriculture we try to do that and it is different so the thesis in fact actually argues that uh, the agrarian crisis between rich and poor states it is there but it is manifested in different ways right and one of the ways in which we also see that is that average household income from cultivation and non farm business have actually reduced in the recent in the last decade and so which is why i think it is important for us to talk about uh, informal accumulation process in the context of agrarian accumulation because firstly we know that there are diverse trajectories of agrarian as well as non agrarian accumulations but they are least studied especially with the focus on accumulation and we also know from the existing literature that the nature of transition in india is not a classic agrarian transition but it is more likely a transition from peasant production to petty commodity production and where poor indians with homes in rural areas are no longer simple peasants or rural wage laborers they are also dependent on migrant wage labor or working in the rural non farm economy and on petty commodity production and trade in the capitalist economy so when we put all this together these studies point out the need to theorize the diversity in trajectories of agrarian transition and the significance of petty commodity production in transformation of rural economy so this paper tries to do that since there is less time i will try to skip the slide and we can come back but one important point to note that is uh, this uh, accumulation without dispossession is an interesting idea when we are talking about diversification of income within the peasant household right this can this uh when we're talking about partial proletarianization or semi proletarianization and this can this accumulation can also happen in a non context of non dynamic agriculture but we will see it as stagnant or it might be with dispossession and east asian experience actually suggests that under the conditions of rising agricultural labor productivity rural industrialization and preferential access to us markets it is possible so dynamic agricultural labor productivity growth in fact allows the possibility of economic growth driven by rural non agrarian economy as a site of surplus labor absorption as well as a site of capital accumulation depending upon how the market question is solved right so our argument would be an informal enterprise or informal sector can be a potential site of capital accumulation and depending on these conditions of market growth into the agricultural labor productivity and uh, another important point to note here is that increase in labor productivity levels of an enterprise can be associated with corresponding increase in capital intensity levels 
and this implies that higher levels of labor productivity in the informal sector can indicate that it's a site of capital accumulation. Uh, if you just see the 21 states that we are talking about, uh, and for these two time points, 2010-11 and 2015-16, uh, like we have seen, there is, of course, positive and strong correlation between agricultural labor productivity and per capita income measured by GSPP. But we also see that agricultural labor productivity and informal sector labor productivity are also highly correlated. And per capita income and the informal sector labor productivity are also correlated. But particularly in rural areas, if we see, it is much stronger. The correlation with the agricultural labor productivity is much stronger. And so in this, uh, in one part of the thesis, we were looking at variations in terms of high and low per capita income. But today I'm going to present about the variations in low and higher agricultural labor productivity states. And it is interesting to note again, even when we take this low productivity, agricultural labor productivity and high agricultural labor productivity states, this correlation of that labor productivity in the rural informal sector, if you note, it's in this high productivity states, it's much higher in, if you compare it with the correlations in terms of per capita GSDP. For instance, here, the per capita GSDP 0.22 and 0.56 is what we see in high productivity states. But the correlation between labor productivity with agriculture and informal sector uh, is actually 0.56 and 0 0.79, which is uh, worthwhile exploring. And uh, so when we're talking about differentiation in the informal sector, empirically, we try to see through these three categories. One is establishments. These are enterprises which are at least one wage worker. Then there are own account enterprises which are operating on a subcontracting basis, but they do not hire any wage labor. And then you have own account enterprises, which neither operate on subcontracting basis, nor they hire any wage labor. So if we look at this own account, non-subcontracting enterprises, they're actually not linked to the labor market in the sense. So, and, but they are the major part of, they are the major concentration in the entire informal enterprises. And, uh, so empirically, what we try to do is first we try to run a multiple linear OLS regression model to study the relationship between labor productivity and capital intensity levels. And secondly, we also study the relationship between capital intensity levels and tendencies towards differentiation of informal enterprises in the form of labor market linkages, A, hired wage labor, and B, subcontracting relation. And for that, we use a binomial logic regression model. So I run two repeated cross sections, one for the year 2010-11 using 67th round data and one for the year 2015-16 uh, using 73rd round data. And here, informal sector activities and the non-agricultural activities comprise of manufacturing, trade, and service. So we also try to see uh, these relationships for all this together and for each sector separately. And here, uh, one point that I have to make is just trying to break away from the rigid unit of state. Uh, we try and see that uh, higher rural areas among the high agriculture productivity in Indian states and urban or let's say among the low productivity region states. So it gives us four groups or four categories of regions. And so this this graph uh, which shows when you're plotting the fixed assets per worker, capital intensity on x-axis and labor productivity on y-axis, we see that in rural areas and in urban areas, there is a positive linear relationship. And the correlations, if you just look at the for 21 states, the correlation coefficients, they are also quite uh, positive and strong. And let me just show my model. So the OLS regression model, how we specify on the, uh, the a Y variable, uh, dependent variable is log GVA per worker. And our X variables, uh, the independent variables are log of capital intensity. And Location of an agriculture, a location of an informal enterprise in a higher agricultural productivity state. Uh, here, because we cannot take agricultural productivity value as such, because there are only 21 states, 21 values, but your enterprises, your sample is more than one lakh. So, because of that, uh, how we try to translate it is in terms of the location, because the literature says location also has an important impact on how the uh, accumulation is impacted, which is why we try to break it down to that location of an enterprise in an urban area or rural area, or in terms of high or low agricultural productivity state. So we are interested in testing the null hypothesis that the coefficients of the above variables are zero 
at a statistical significance level of 5%. And if the null hypothesis is rejected, it is reasonable to infer that capital intensity levels, the location of an enterprise in high or low agricultural productivity states, and its location in rural or urban areas have a significant statistically significant impact on the labor productivity levels. And other than that, we also look at the enterprise characteristics of some of the controls, whether an enterprise is registered or unregistered. For a registered enterprise, we expect it to have a positive impact on the labor productivity. If it's a household enterprise, we expect it to have a negative impact. Then you have ownership type also, which is somewhat uh, linking the gender and the nature of enterprises. So we expect that female uh, proprietary enterprises will have a lesser uh, productivity than a male enterprise, proprietary enterprise. And the other category is uh, owner social group. So here we expect that uh, relative to uh, open category or others category. So you will have a uh, negative for at least ST and SC enterprise, right? And so some, so some of the interesting characteristics that we see for the sample, is that G, mean GDA per worker and mean fixed assets per worker are the highest in establishments, followed by own account enterprises, which are not on subcontract, and the least productive are the own account enterprises that are on subcontracting basis. And then we see that urban enterprises constitute more than 50% of the sample proportion of establishments, but less than 50% of the sample proportions of own account enterprises of non subcontracting. And we also see that at least Two thirds of establishments, own account non subcontracting and own account subcontracting enterprises are concentrated in high agricultural productivity states in uh, 2010 11. But however, all types of enterprises kind of declined in this high productivity states in the 73rd round. And in other words, the proportion of informal enterprises in each type increased in low agricultural productivity states in the 73rd round. Right? And uh, when we are talking about the other enterprise characteristics, while two thirds of establishments are registered enterprises, less than one third of this own account enterprises categories are registered enterprises. And uh, on the contrary, less than one fifth of establishments, around two fifths of this own account non subcontracting, and more than four fifths of own accounting subcontracting enterprises are household enterprises. So, subcontracting is largely a characteristic of household enterprises. And uh, we also actually see that uh, that uh, ST owned the lowest ST owned enterprise, lowest proportion of enterprises, followed by ST in each enterprise type, and also the proportion of this own account enterprises uh, owned by OBCs is also higher than that of others category. Uh, yeah, so while most establishments and own account non subcontracting are male proprietary enterprises, most subcontracting own account are female proprietary enterprises. Besides non proprietary enterprises, which is parties, partnership, and other enterprises, which constitute very like minimal, like less than 5% of the sample. And we also have a category of expanding enterprises. It is basically a qualitative measure where the uh, enterprise owner is asked how. Do, how does he or she think the enterprise is performing in the last three years? And the establishments constitute the highest proportion of these expanding enterprise uh, among three types, right? And uh, this highlighted on the major things, and we do see, however, we expected those relationships times with higher, quite high level of significance, or much at one percent level in most parts. And one point that I would like to draw your attention to is that the coefficients have reduced. Um, the coefficients uh, have actually reduced between time. And I will tell you, discuss about that. And the similar results we also see for own account enterprises, not on subcontracting. And I tried to plot these estimated labor productivity levels, which we obtained from the regression. And then we actually see that, uh, and, yeah, so we actually can see that it is higher in the rural, higher agricultural productivity regions when compared to low agricultural productivity regions. And similarly, in the urban areas also, higher agricultural productivity regions have higher uh, productivity than uh, the low productivity states. Um, let me just... So the summary of the results that we are finding is that there's a positive and significant relationship between capital intensity and labor productivity levels in establishment own account non subcontracting and own account subcontracting enterprise in all economic activities. This indicates that at least informal enterprises across each type can become potential sites of capital accumulation. 
And within each type of enterprise, the labor productivity levels are higher in high, high agricultural productivity states than in low agricultural productivity states. And it's also higher in urban areas than in rural areas. And of all these four regions that we're talking about, it's the highest in urban uh, high agricultural productivity and the least in rural low agricultural productivity. We also find that labor productivity is significantly higher in rural lab states than in rural lab states, vice versa. And so for me, but this result is important because it informs the urban bias informal sector policy making to take a serious note of the potential of rural informal sector as a site of capital accumulation, particularly in higher agricultural productivity states. And uh, in the, so we have also seen when the coefficients have reduced, especially on the indicator of high agricultural productivity states between two time points. And when we see uh, using a method of overlapping co coefficients, it is significantly different and it is adversely affected. So we think it could probably be because of the worsening agrarian crisis in around this point of time, which we try to talk about in one of the other chapters of the thesis. And in the logic model, uh, what we actually do is we are trying to estimate the probability of an enterprise. It's a binary dependent variable, Y1. If it's Kanti, one, it's, yeah. Kanti, I'll just I take do, five I minutes. Don't, I don't want to interrupt, but you've got five, seven more minutes. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm I, going to I know this, this is also very rich. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I'm, so, so this is a binary dependent variable where one, if it's y1 is equal to one, that enterprise is an establishment. And if it's zero, it's own account enterprise, not on subcontracting. Right? And here, if the null hypothesis is rejected, it's reasonable to infer that capital intensity levels, location of an enterprise in high or low agricultural productivity state, and its location in rural or urban areas have a significant, statistically significant impact on the probability of an enterprise to form labor market linkages via higher wage labor. And we take similar uh, variables. So I'm not going to uh, tell you the relationships which are expected, but we do see, I'm presenting here the average marginal effects. So we do see that the marginal effects are highly significant. This is for all activities together, but we cannot say that about the higher agricultural productivity states, at least in 67 rounds. But now when we try and, but at least here, one thing we see when we compare to manufacturing, the possibility of an enterprise becoming an establishment is much lesser in trade or services. Okay? And that is what we see when we break it down between three different sectors, let's say manufacturing, trade, and services. And we do see that the location of an enterprise in high productivity states has a quite significant impact. But we cannot really say that about services yet. And just to focus here, we are taking contract, contrast of average marginal effects. What this result really means is that, uh, that within rural manufacturing, high location of an enterprise in high agricultural productivity state has a higher probability of being an establishment which will hire wage labor. And that's what is shown here. Right? So I'm only focusing on rural manufacturing because it's important and interesting for us. So this is what I try to summarize. So the probability of enterprise being an establishment, hiring wage labor relative to a known account enterprise, which is not hiring wage labor or not subcontracting enterprises, it increases with higher capital intensity levels across all categories. And it's higher among manufacturing and services relative to trade. It's higher in urban areas compared to rural areas. And the most important result here is that it's higher among higher agriculture labor productivity states relative to lower agriculture productivity state in manufacturing, but its impact on trade and service establishments is ambiguous. And since the, our focus is not much on these characteristics, I'm trying to skip, but it's interesting to note that SCST owned enterprises uh, are less likely to be establishments. And something similar with own account non subcontract, these are like subcontracting when you're talking about it. Uh, yeah. So it is the important thing to notice it reduces with capital intensity level. So lower capital intensive enterprises are more likely to become subcontracting enterprises. And the subcontracting is mainly a feature only of manufacturing activity. In trade and services, it's almost minimal. So in the entire study, we take only manufacturing and then see how the subcontracting has 
uh, taking place. And we also see a drastic shift between 2010-11 and 2015-16 that there is also earlier, it was mostly concentrated in poor, uh, low productivity of poor states. But in the later period, we also see a rapid proliferation of these subcontracting enterprises into rich and high productivity states, uh, which is a matter of concern. And that also, we again think it's probably linked to the adverse uh, gradient crisis and lack of alternative opportunities because it's worsening in rich states also. So uh, therefore, I conclude that on the supply side, capital intensity levels are a crucial factor in determining the labor productivity levels in the informal sector. And higher capital intensity levels in informal enterprise are more likely to create tendencies towards differentiation in the form of age, higher wage labor. On the other hand, lower capital intensity levels are more likely to create tendencies towards subcontracting. And the ability of enterprises, informal enterprises to accumulate is also significantly related to the enterprise location in a higher productivity state, whether it's in rural or uh, urban area, because it's a key demand side factor. And looking at all these related, uh, regions, like I said, we know that rural uh, sectors of the higher agricultural productivity states have a greater potential towards differentiation and potential towards accumulation, particularly in manufacturing activity, right? So final argument here would be that there is a possibility that these in informal enterprises can become potential sites of accumulation and their ability to accumulate is a function of market growth, which is in turn linked to the agriculture labor productivity on the demand side. Thank you. Well done, Kanti, for cramming an incredibly rich and complicated argument into about 35 minutes. Um, there's agriculture and non-agriculture, and there are different kinds of firms and different sectors and um, high agricultural productivity, low productivity regions, and then variations over time, and 21 states, and dozens and dozens of variables. So you've actually managed to make a coherent story of something very complicated. I'd now like to call on Dr. Bhimashra Reddy to give his discussion, discussants comments and reactions um, to this very rich presentation. Over to you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Barbara. Um, uh, thanks, uh, FAS, for uh, inviting me to discuss Kranti's paper. And, uh, uh, I should admit uh, that actually this, is, as Professor Barbara pointed out, uh, this is a very complicated uh, and complex uh, argument that Kranti uh, uh, made. Uh, but however, I have few clarificatory questions uh, as I myself uh, do not uh, have much expertise in this uh, non-agrarian field. But uh, nonetheless, let me ask you a few clarificatory questions and uh, maybe that will have some implications for some of the findings that you brought out uh, through your rich uh, data analysis. So, Kranti, first uh, question is, uh, so uh, this is um, with respect to you categorizing states into rich and poor states. See, the thing is, uh, like any other poverty line or any line which has uh, which is drawn, right, is basically arbitrary line. So, I don't know what is, the, maybe you have expounded it in somewhere in your paper or in thesis, but uh, the demarcation of rich and poor state uh, uh, seems to be quite arbitrary, but that's bound to happen. Whenever you draw a line, that's going to be arbit arbitrary. But uh, but actually to, because you're making a larger point, I think uh, bringing in robustness is important because if you change the definition of rich and poor states, um, probably it will have implications for your findings. So uh, have you tried uh, you know, changing the definition of, uh, of the, but are for the poor and rich states. And other point uh, which is related to this um, is this uh, that uh, up to this morning I was looking at uh, the share of the GDP, share of uh, um, agriculture to the uh, GS, uh, state gro uh, gross domestic product. So most of the rich states that you have cited, I've looked at, they're the ones which have the least share. For example, if you look at Himachal Pradesh, or Karnataka, Maharashtra, Gujarat, Uttarakhand, all of them, and none of them actually have, except Himachal Pradesh, which is the, contributes about uh, nine, 14%, and then also Haryana, this contributes about 19% to the total GSDP, right? Um, uh, sorry, gross uh, domestic product of the state. 
And uh, so the thing is, that means actually, why is it important? That shows that actually demand is not actually generated in agriculture because larger share of the income of the state uh, the, uh, comes from elsewhere. So it is not necessary that then even if suppose my share, uh, I can argue that actually if the share, for example, in the state like Maharashtra and Karnataka, which are not very highly high agricultural productive states, right, as per your uh, classification. And he much I can't. Uh, uh, Professor, you're on. Uh, you muted yourself. You can mute. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, the point that I was making is the states like Maharashtra and Karnataka and Himachal Pradesh, which have only 10% of their GDP coming from agriculture, uh, implies that they actually demand for their uh, non farm products come from non agrarian source, right? So it is possible. And then obviously, uh, if you look at all these three states, Karnataka, Maharashtra, and Himachal Pradesh, which are rich states, their um, productivity, agricultural labor productivity is, uh, is lower. They are not highly high agricultural, uh, early, uh, the productivity is not very large, right? As compared to the states which you have said, high productive, uh, highly productive, uh, agricultural productive uh, states, are, productivity well uh, is high right that's uh, that, that's the thing so that means like the source of uh, not necessarily it may not be dealing the process is may, may be dealing within this rich states the process also further uh, diversified it's not just the agrarian productivity which is actually like putting hand uh, putting the income in the people's hand and then that is driving either accumulation or a growth of uh, you know a, a growth or differentiation within the informal sector so that's why it's i think uh, it's important to check your um, check uh, the robustness of your results by actually changing the cutoffs for dividing the states into rich and poor um, so that is uh, one uh, argument other uh, other robustness one can uh, robustness check that one can think about is that actually because you know now that situation assessment survey is available for the period for which you are studying uh, both we have around 2003 and as well as later on for 2013-14 and then as recent as um, <clears throat> last year, uh, a couple of years back, we have situation assessment surveys. So rather than going by uh, GVA uh, or uh, by capital GVA in agriculture, you can go for the income. That is in, that's actually more closely reflects the demand that is generated in the rural sector on um, how much demand that is actually generating for generating for the products that are produced in informal uh, informal non-agrarian settings, right? So I think you should actually uh, corroborate your results with uh, situation assessment service income data, rural income data, rather than taking, uh, but obviously it has a limitation because it only deals with uh, present households. But actually, I think that's also in a sense because you're also focusing on small and petty, uh, petty production, so in within agriculture as well. So I think that will uh, enhance your robustness of your results. So this is uh, with respect to the results that you have uh, presented. And other thing that has uh, uh, that uh, uh, struck me when I was going through your presentation is that, yes, you have used um, detailed uh, secondary uh, data but uh, what is missing from uh, the presentation which would have made the presentation more interesting and more uh, uh, impressive uh, more, more interesting and more uh, you know it would have increased uh, my at least my learning experience is that uh, um, that what for example in the rich states what are the kind of the industries non farm industries that you are talking about i cannot think about uh, any non farm industries that uh, you know specific to the states like gujarat that are very different from the you know, non-farm industries that are driving, uh, you know, the growth of non-farm, uh, non-agrarian industries in West Bengal, right? Um, so th th that some sort of the qualitative uh, information uh, would have been useful uh, to further complement uh, your findings, especially given that, you know, you're talking about larger process of agri uh, change in non-agrarian setting. I think that would have uh, really helped, uh, helped us. Um, and other thing that I have, again, I, I, as I said, I'm not, uh, I've not done any work at, uh, in this area, but I, it, it was a learning experience. But this huge, um, I've looked at the non-farm sector, I've uh, uh, at least uh, gone through the literature uh, on non-farm sector quite widely, uh, if not recently, but uh, quite uh, some time back. So there's a huge literature on non-farm sector, and most of the work is uh, mainstream, all right? So there's a... Uh, um, Peter Lanjo and uh, uh, Lanjo. Uh, actually, I've um, 
done a review of paper in 2001 and subsequently they've written several of the papers and then the art of non-farm work especially focusing on labor that has been done but obviously and some of the reviews papers some of the paper, papers actually talked about the productivity elements and their interlinkages between agriculture and non-agricultural sector how is this work you know engages with the interlinkages between agrarian sector and non-agrarian sector obviously when you're talking about interlinkages you are also talking about demand generated in agriculture especially the post green revolution period lot of work both in in the you know uh, hetero uh, heterodox uh, uh, you know domain as well as mainstream uh, or whatever the, the uh, other uh, neoclassical uh, framework people have explored the linked linkages people have in, uh, talked about the connections between this and um, all of this right so how the, uh, in the pro, in, in the presentation at least i didn't get to see the you know how your work engages with whatever the findings that uh, those studies have come out with. So these are the, some of the things that I wanted to uh, you know, flag. And uh, it was really interesting. And uh, there's a lot of uh, things for me to learn. And I hope uh, uh, you will get other comments from other people. And uh, you know, we will get to know more about your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Reddy. Um, Dr. Nandari, would you like to reply to that now because I think the questions can go in a number of different directions and yeah. um, Dr. Reddy's questions yeah. are quite focused. Yeah. So, so could I give you five minutes yeah. to respond yeah. immediately? Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Professor Binisha, for this comment. Actually, so I think uh, I did not make it clear on my demarcation criteria for the recent overseas because I've just uh, I've taken the all India average uh, per capita income. So so that because I thought that would be one way of looking at this difference, and I did try to look at uh, other kinds of classifications also. And for me, so in the thesis in one of the chapters, we actually see within rich states there are two other trajectories that appear. One is the trajectories with uh, economic growth with divergence, where your agriculture and non-agricultural labor productivity are actually diverging. And then we have another set of states where it is sort of converging. Like let's say Punjab, Kerala, Haryana, these fall towards states where these two productivity levels are converging. Like we discussed with Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, all those things are in the categories where it is diverging. Right. So that is one way. And then uh, also, especially even for this particular paper, in these two points of time, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Himachal Pradesh, if I remove them, like, so if I take away these exceptions, and then if I just look at the low agriculture productivity and poor states, and high agriculture productivity rich states, which make my case stronger, then it's very interesting for me to see that this relationship between this informal sector productivity and this uh, agriculture labor productivity is, or per capita income also, it's so much stronger only for this uh, high and high agriculture productivity rich states. The correlations, at least for those particular states, uh, state that very clearly. So that I have actually dealt with in, in the thesis in other parts that I'm trying to argue in previous classification. So yeah, uh, that is one part of it. And then you were asking about huh, the demand coming for especially states like Maharashtra, Karnataka, Himachal Pradesh, where the demand basis probably not the agriculture because their output shares are much lower. Uh, see, uh, so that is what actually in that context of the divergence, that is what we try to say. Economic growth is happening, but what it uh, ends up is it runs into the problems of inequality. So uh, that is where, where I was trying to say how your market question is solved becomes important uh, for this whole sustainable per capita income group. So I believe that if you're not able to uh, 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 sustain your demand either from urban or from export market growth, then these kind of economies can collapse. I mean, your uh, domestic uh, demand base is much weaker, right? Uh, so I think that is the kind of problem that you will see, which will be different from the states which are having the uh, convergence, more got, sort of higher incomes in agriculture and convergence. So I think so that is what would be my response to that. And then, uh, yeah, situation assessment surveys using that, I really thought of doing that, but then uh, dealing with that would have become a thesis in itself for me because already I was dabbling with enterprise surveys and also employment surveys. 
so uh, that would have taken so much time but i that is in plan and i would really like to look at that data for this because at least so far now i did not go to the unit level data for the situation assessment service but i did try to take from the reports etc what these figures look like like so in my second chapter third chapter where i'm talking about agrarian change and agrarian accumulation patterns i do try to take this household annual household income figures which are also presented there are some studies what the uh, kamal got so there are few studies which are already taking this and they present us those figures also so i try to rely on them to see how things are changing between the years though they have not covered 2018 19 these are a bit older studies but yeah that would be very interesting for me to see and like you said it will strengthen my argument in terms of demand and yes what is missing is a qualitative analysis of like how what are the kind of industries and uh, i i do talk about this in another part of my thesis a little bit but again not so much because uh, for me i was trying to understand mostly this macro relationship so at each, for each state i did see what are the nature of industries how are how are they changing and especially uh, one of my thesis examiners also gave a comment in terms of subcontracting would it be any different because different states have different industries but at least in that context we have seen that in manufacturing uh it is not very different i mean at least these relationships of that lower capital intensity linked to uh the subcontracting tendency those kind of macro relationships stand despite the differences in the nature of industries but again there are only so yeah but this this also is a very richer analysis and i certainly agree that it's missing and uh, it is taken care of some part in other city but not completely and then um yeah so the interlinkages between agriculture and non agriculture sectors so especially suppose if we look at uh, the hymer resin model that good model all those which are talking about these interlinkages qualitatively also they for instance they take look at taiwan philippines and then they do show that you know in one context the higher productivity has made a difference but in the other context it did not so in that way in my literature review and surveys i do try to bring in those arguments but again here because i was just trying to see the impact of the location uh, i did not go into the dynamics of this interlinkages which would have probably come out much clearer if it is a primary field study or something which in this thesis i could not do. so that would be my response for you thank you very much um thank you That, that those are very generative responses um and i think that discussion can go on um for quite a long time but time is um finite um we have about 5 minutes until the hour and then another quarter of an hour um i would like to add my tapani piece to this conversation um uh, it's true that the agricultural wage is the most neglected variable in macroeconomics and your hypothesis which is that agricultural labor productivity is fundamental to um agrarian and structural transformations is also a, a, a simple question but it it's an incredibly complicated thing to answer um i have a question though um if we accept that there's no production without labor how can this relationship not be driven by the productivity or the intensity of land and capital um you move towards that in your analysis of the informal economy but doesn't it lie behind your basic hypothesis that um capital intensity capital assets in agriculture drive labor productivity yet you find that that that's not so can you say more about why land productivity isn't significant as a driver of labor productivity which is the key driver of your hypotheses um then on your regionalization um what i would like to do is to to very 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 quickly push up um to 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 share a screen is it is it showing is it up no professor it is not up okay let me i don't want to waste time um 
but I think these yes. yeah, no, it's coming up yeah. from the current yeah. slide. Okay, so these are just maps, and these speak to Dr. Reddy's um, point about how you classify regions. Um, when you start classifying agrarian variables by um, without ignoring state boundaries, you get these very powerful regions in India. Um, and I just want to put two or three maps up as a provocation to the audience, because um, if one tries to proxy capitalist agriculture, which goes on to have multipliers, which are class specific in the informal economy, which is a point I think that you need to develop, um, then you've got a lot of perplexity. This map is labor and, whoops, hang on. These maps are the commodification of agriculture through inputs and through the marketed surplus. And I've put them up, not just because they show regions which are not coterminous with states, but they show very different kinds of regions. And here's land rent and here's petty commodity production. And the two are quite similar. And I will um, stop sharing there, but I hope the point is made and I can share the maps later that um, there's a plurality of regions of, of capitalist agricultural transformation and of productivity, of labor relations, and then their multipliers in the non-agrarian economy. And so uh, I think that your work, which has um, investigated the relationship between uh, agrarian and non-agrarian activity, which has been so difficult to include in village level classifications of class, you've um, managed something extraordinary at the level of states, but there are other kinds of regions and that's something that we have to grasp and research further. Um, I have a niggle about informality. Um, yes, labor and yes, enterprise, but these days informal activity is selective and complicated. And if we do ignore it, it won't go away. Um, informal, um, the, the firms that you're calling infor informal are often registered with licenses and bank accounts and subject to GST and so on. Um, and they're also not registered. There's some premises, some activities inside registered enterprises and whether or not they're registered, they're non-compliant or they're faced with non-enforceable laws as with tax and environmental laws and labor laws. So the idea that we can just divide the economy between formal and informal is one which I think has passed its sell-by date. And again, it's a challenge to uh, research in the future. The central result that you have is that accumulation may happen in all three types of unincorporated enterprise, enterprises with the labor force, own account enterprise, which is man with cycle, which is single individuals, and then enterprises with subcontracting, which are very few. I wonder about that statistic. Anyway, that accumulation may happen in the informal economy as a result that we've known through surveys and through ethnographies ever since the 1970s. And what you must say about your result is that you have shown this at the All India level and over time, although the results are actually very complicated. And the earlier literature, which is not compatible with the kind of database that you're using in your research, um, shows that the whole process is class specific and that the relations between the agrarian and the non-agrarian economy vary systematically with class. And I hope that you could develop that further. I don't, I've got many more comments, but um, I will, stop there, except to say that we're all in agrarian political economy wrestling with conceptual plurality. You could address um, theories of, of, um, of, of multipliers, of agrarian urbanization, um, of growth linkages, they all have all kinds of theoretical ancestry. And these days we're forced to use the words and the concepts that come from a vast variety of origins. Um, in your presentation, you've got accumulation, you've got wage labor deriving from Marxist theory, and you have informality, which is 
um, coming from a set of theoretical fields of its own. And I wonder if you feel comfortable with that and whether the audience feels comfortable with that. Um, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. And maybe turn to um, Matan Manogna's question in the box, um, which is uh, following on from what I've just, the end of my rant, um, which is about your analytical framework and its ontological underpinnings. Um, and perhaps the way I expressed it was, was um, cruder and simpler, but perhaps you could address that. Oh, now, Ma yeah. Matam, are you there? Would you like to say any more? Yeah. yeah. Because your question is very broad. Yeah. Is, is Matam there? Yes, uh, thank you for taking up my question. Um, it is very broad and uh, I was actually thinking about it in reference to the French regulation approach, which is the other way that class relations are dealt and capitalism is studied. And, uh, but I'm just a master's student right now and I do not have enough depth to kind of unpack it or understand it. So I was just thinking if um, Kranti had something more to say about it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can I answer? Yeah. Yes, so, please uh, do. Just combining her question, what you were talking about, the framework and drawing from different kinds of streams. So mm -hmm. initially, that is what it kind of took me a lot of time to wrap my head around three things. So one, I have literature which is talking about agrarian change, and then there was this literature about uh, informality and structural change, uh, views in models and all that. And then we have just the interlinkages, like earlier Professor Dimitri was also talking, just yeah. they were talking about. So, uh, and then I tried to, I had a graph earlier in my proposal phase where there's three things are here. And then in center, I have put a triangle saying accumulation process. So I try to, I thought I bring these three things together to see that because uh, it was hard for me to initially find studies which are talking about informal enterprises. When there is a discussion on informal labor, then almost all these aspects are being touched because there's extensive literature on that. But when I'm talking to understand the accumulation or labor productivity, all these things in informal enterprises, most studies are between formal and informal manufacturing sector. So there were very, most studies concentrated only on that. And then I'm finding lots of primary studies which are specific to, let's say some cities, most cities, which are talking about experiences of informal enterprise. So in that way, it is definitely difficult for me. And I know this is too much ambitious to bring these three things together. But uh, my idea was basically, I want to position myself with an agrarian political economy, with a Marxian agrarian political economy. So I want to try and understand the accumulation. But as a way, in, in the way I'm progressing, then these are the things that I have to uh, engage with because literature is discussing that. But ideally, I would like to be engaging mostly with petty commodity production and how that translates and how this differentiation uh, tendencies take place or accumulation happens using that approach. And that is the central. So that I kind of have a discussion about this in my literature review and theoretical framework chapter that I'm trying to make that my center and then engage with other aspects Surrounding that. So, how those relate to this approach? And that's what I try and do. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question completely, but yeah. I think there is a big literature on informal enterprise, but as you say, um, perhaps less on rural informal yes, enterprise. Absolutely. There's a big literature on industrial clusters, yes, industrial yeah. districts in India from yes, Mark Holmstrom's yes. work onwards. Yeah, there, yeah. Are, there, are, there is literature on marketing systems, which has had a fallow period, but um, Shreya Sinha's work. Um, uh, oh gosh. Um, there's somebody whose names I've just forgotten who's working on fertilizer dealers. There's quite a lot of literature but it's quite dispersed in different disciplines. Um, yes. And you- you, and you, in you have a focus on petty production, which is a Marxist term or a Marxian agrarian economic term. Um, 
and your assumption is that petty production is going to differentiate into what you call establishments which have wage labor and wage labor but you also said at the start of your presentation that it persists that these forms persist and and they grow they grow in numbers so they are growing by multiplication you're nodding um and not by uh -huh. accumulation you're not they're not necessarily accumulating or you can accumulate a bit within a family enterprise yes but then the main drive is multiplication which poses some very interesting questions about the social surplus if petty production is not creating surplus value because the petty producer is both capitalist and labor and is exploiting himself or his family how is that social surplus which enables expansion by multiplication how is that being created and i don't see very much research on problems such as those which are quite fundamental because india is completely stuffed full of petty commodity producing firms i wonder how you react to that yeah in fact uh, this is the discussion that i've had, been having about this uh, i've read where one of the papers you also argue about this multiplication and accumulation so it looks like it's multiplication for sure at least in some parts of it but then i can only investigate this question of accumulation especially through the expanded reproduction whether that's happening or not at enterprise level it only can be studied through a uh, primary study yeah. at least taking certain pockets of it and that is the biggest limitation of my study because it doesn't go to that level and i don't have major sources of information about that but to me at least uh, the growth of establishments at least even in the sample if i've seen that uh, between these two time points the percentage of establishments have increased right so that uh, again i think this is defined uh, for that i think like how professor beemeshwar said going down to the industry level because competition is important factor to understand this at the industry level how competition plays a role so different industries react in a different way uh, to competition so i think there i might find slightly different answer and especially i think if i can narrow down my study to just seeing the manufacturing because now it turns out rural manufacturing has a greater story in terms of these relationships how it can work out i think then it might actually help me then i can even in fact take uh, into consideration studies which are dealing with the relationship between formal and informal manufacturing yeah. there are quite a lot of them although they are not distinction yeah. between rural and urban but then i think just limiting myself to that then i'll be able to answer this question and position my study in that so i think that could be one way of going forward yeah Thank you, Kranti. It's ten minutes past the hour. Um, th there are there are no other questions in the chat, unless I'm blind to the chat. I don't think there are. Um, is there anybody in the audience burning with a question they would like to ask? I'm sure this is not because the topic is not interesting. It's because the topic is so rich and difficult to. Grass. Yes. Dr. Reddy, would you like to join in? Yeah, two more clarificatory parts uh, so that is a very uh, limited uh, points that I want to make. One is that uh, um, Kanti, when you actually, uh, Dr. Kanti, when you compare the coefficients over time, I think the more appropriate uh, way, because you say that the, the coefficients have actually declined, I think the more appropriate and more technically in sound way to you know compare the coefficient would be by introducing by planning a pooled regression and uh, introducing the yeah. interaction term time you know interaction term otherwise i think uh, you cannot uh, say whether it really significantly increased yeah. or not right yeah. that's the most yeah. appropriate way of doing it probably you would have done it earlier but here you have showed a different uh, regressions the other thing is about uh, is again uh, uh, i'm not uh, as professor bagara elaborated it and uh, quite uh, quite uh, in detail i mean uh, but uh, one thing that i want to understand so for example uh, when i looked at uh, data quite uh, some time back um, west bengal from the labor again point from the point of uh, labor right so those who were engaged in non farm work especially women right 
bulk of women are either engaged in bead making or embroidery this is the kind of uh, this is the, so this so if you uh, go and see so self employed uh, i am not using any marxist term here but i'm just using the official uh, uh, you know uh, data uh, how it captures the uh, their, their uh, economic activities so for example what how does this bd makers develop into enterprises like they do they actually die down and uh, or is there for example take that industry do they actually become i know I, i can't think about women actually becoming as independent uh, you know formal or informal uh, pd making industry so that's so th that's impossible at least from the from the feel experience of telangana i know for sure so that actually this never going to be a, a story right similarly this embroidery uh, probably women stitching you know as a tailor as a woman doing some kind of uh, uh you know embroidery work i can't think i mean at least I mean, that there's a possibility there at least you can set up a boutique uh, a boutique depending on uh, you know changing nature of fashion style and you know demand uh, but uh, i again i i can't think about uh, similarly if you took it if you look at from the point of view women who are engaged as petty producers or self employed bulk of them cannot transform themselves at their own account enterprise enterprises or own account you know whatever that you call into an enterprise that's no differentiation or no accumulation can at least um, in my from non marxist point of view can you can lead at least in the near future can transform into a industry or a lead to accumulation in their uh, in their specific industries so i think uh, again i do i made this point i think specific industries uh, that which can tell the stories that you want to you know bring out would have uh, helped us to understand your macro analysis in more fine grained uh, fashion otherwise it's uh, it will uh, you know become difficult to most of the people to grab their head around it okay a uh, grab um grapple with it so that that's that's these are the points oh, okay I'll stop here. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Kanti. Yeah. So I think uh, we should wind up with your response to Dr. Reddy. Oh, sure. So, so Dr. Reddy, so actually the pool regression, I've been thinking about it, and it's on the way, and I've started working on that. But uh, the reason why I have kept it in my thesis also, like independent, uh, repeated cross section only, is because I wanted to see whether the regression impact. How does it even look? is it even the same similar kind of relation between two time points then it's worth exploring so that's where i stopped because that was the last part of my thesis analysis but i am continuing moving ahead with pool regression to see further and yes so when we're talking about something like west bengal and all kinds of things so uh, non farm yeah women so uh, quite honestly ever since i began working on this thesis i started wrapping my head around how do i understand productivity growth in such kind of enterprise like what does it even mean for productivity growth in this kind of like bd making but like you said this bd making embroidery uh, mostly female proprietary enterprises they are sort of in subcontracting relationship as far as i understand like putting out or piece rate wage workers so they are in mostly at least from my understanding i have seen that these are, that is a kind of relationship that they are in and in my analysis where it fits is that they are related to the lowest capital intensity level so when we are talking about differentiation tendency if there is a broader market growth they are more likely to dissolve into that wage labor side of it rather than uh, growing into an enterprise theoretically speaking and that is the possibility that uh, is i'm seeing and uh, yeah whether they can so the, which is why like, they may or may not be an enterprise it's also a lot of political factors class caste the role of state all these things come and how the support is given whether they can collectively form an enterprise but one woman make it or not I, that yeah like you said it may or may not be a possibility and like west bengal also i think since you brought up west bengal uh, one thing west bengal and kerala what i noticed in my data is that these two states have had land reform whether successful or unsuccessful is a different debate but at least what we see because of that i guess is that there's a lot of rural non farm activity in these two states which is like undeniable that impact uh, in in terms of the output contribution also i wish there was a way where 
state level also we can divide and see rural gdp and urban gdp but the data is so complicated it's not even available mostly so if that would have been so much uh, wonderful for my study but yeah so that way it's uh, these states this, this does have an impact having land reforms and then uh, and non agriculture linking back to your old question about the demand where it's coming so like west bengal though it's a bit higher agricultural productivity state it's constrained its growth is constrained in many ways because the urbanization industry industrialization has not happened urban industry so it's the non agriculture growth is not just taking place as much as in the other rich states you see so i think there are so many factors that are kind of shaping this factor definitely like you said it's not really, uh, complicated but i think that's where i would like to end okay kanti you have summarized the hour and a quarter very well by saying that this is a very rich sector you have made an important contribution at the level of states a lot of the questions have asked you to go below the level of states in various ways and what that, that is telling you is that there's an enormous program of research emanating from the results that you've struggled to create and while we were on theoretical plurality and conceptual plurality not only do you have all these different theories but then you have the data containers the classification systems of the official data that you're forced to use which introduces all kinds of slippage anyway many many thanks to you and to dr bimeshwar reddy for a very fascinating session and before i hand back to the foundation um i look forward to september the 29th a month from today when um b satita from the iit delhi is going to talk about agricultural and rural labor markets um thank you all very much over to the foundation uh thank you professor babra with your permission i would like to propose a vote of thanks to everybody who is here today uh i would like to extend my thanks first and foremost to kanthi nanduri for her insightful presentation and dr bimeshwar for their for his participation and comments i would especially grateful to professor babra harris white for chairing the session so effectively I thank Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung South Asia for their generous support in making this series possible. I thank all the attendees for participating and making this a good discussion. I'm also thankful to the online team at FAS, Sandeepan Thapas, Deepak Sethu and Rakesh for their role in conducting this program very smoothly. Before we end the session, I would like to inform you about the next seminar of the series. Professor Barbara has already uh, mentioned it. On the last Thursday of September, that is the 29th of September, Mr. B Satisha will be presenting his research. he'll be speaking about agriculture and rural labor markets in india satisha is doing his phd at the indian institute of technology delhi he's currently a research fellow at the azim prem university bangalore we will be posting more details about the event on our website which is fas.org.in and social media handles in the coming days you can find us at fas agri studies on twitter instagram facebook and linkedin and youtube i request that you follow our website and social media handles to not only get updates about this seminar series but also about the other work that we do We have recently concluded a series on social media posts on agricultural tendency in India. If there is something that interests you, uh, do check them out. A recording of the previous session that featured Dr. Arithri Chakravarti is available on YouTube. You can take a look at that as well. She spoke about the impact of information on technical efficiency of agricultural production in India. This session too will be made available on YouTube in the near future. Any questions that could not be answered during the session due to lack of time will be sent to the presenter. Uh, Professor Judith Thayer, for example, I'll ask for a version of the paper that can be looked at. We shall check with the presenter and get back to the attendees with these answers as soon as possible. Uh, with this, we will be ending this session. Once again, thank you very much for your participation and cooperation. Have a good evening.